Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Nelson, and I'm the dean of the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts here at the National Gallery of Art. And I am extraordinarily happy to welcome you to the second of Anna DeVere Smith's four lectures, uh, the 73rd Mellon Lectures in the Fine Arts. And I hope you were with us last week or got a chance to hear Anna's lectures last week. I'm very excited to see what she will do today. And as we introduced her last week to all of you, we won't go through all of that again. So please join me in welcoming Anna DeVere Smith to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen Nelson, Kaywin Feldman, Kyra Cabanas, <coughs> Sarah Battle, Gary Calgano, Jen Rakoski, and the entire staff of the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts here at the National Gallery. Um, you know, whenever I go into an environment that's not really a theater, I feel like this. I'm asking people to get ready for the circus has come to town. Will you please uh, help me thank these people who are putting up with uh, an actor? <laughs> Last week on Chasing That Which Is Me, Chasing That Which Is, Chasing That Which Is Not Me, Chasing That Which Is Me, let me try it again. Last week on Chasing That Which Is Not Me, Chasing That Which Is Me. I'll give you the background, like, you know, in the sitcoms they tell you, series when I tell you what happened. I established that there are three keys to how my work came about as a dramatist. One, Shakespeare, my fascination with the chemistry of what happens when one allows the words, their sound and rhythm, as well as their meaning to evoke character or persona speak the speech I pray you as I pronounced it to you trippingly on the tongue. Two, a linguist who I happen to be talking to at a cocktail party gave me three questions that I could use when interviewing real life people that would change their speech habits in a way that I would have speech, parent, uh, speak patterns to evoke character and persona. Uh, those questions were, have you ever come to death? Have you ever come close to death? Have you ever come close to death? <laughs> Different. Have you ever been accused of something that you did not do? Ever been accused of something that you did not do? And do you know the circumstances of your birth? I don't remember the name of that linguist, nor I do, do I remember who took me to the cocktail party, but uh, those questions changed my life. The last key was something that my grandfather said when I was a girl, which is if you say a word often enough, it becomes you. If you say a word often enough, it becomes you. And so I've decided to spend most of my adult life trying to become America word for word. Uh, and to do that, of course, I had to come in contact with that which is not me, chasing that which is not me, the late. Mary Ellen Mark, a great photographer known for photographing the unfamous, well, she also uh, photographed a lot of the famous as well, wrote in um, her catalog, the catalog to her exhibition, American Odyssey, Odyssey, that the camera gave her the necessary distance to get close to strangers. That is what the Panasonic RQ212 shoebox cassette recorder, then the Sony 5000 EV Pressman, uh, portable cassette recorder, the DAT recorder, and finally my iPhone gave me the necessary distance to get close to strangers. Today's lecture is about a play that I wrote for the Atlantic Magazine, This Ghost of Slavery. It's the only, only the second play ever published in the Atlantic's 167 years of existence. The first being a short play by Jean Cocteau, which was published in 1930. Many of you have the magazine in hand. Raise your hand if you managed to get a magazine. I can kind of see, okay, good. So you can take it home and uh, then you can read the whole play. Um, uh, and that is thanks to the generosity of Jeffrey Goldberg and the Atlantic Magazine. Scott Stossel was my editor, who upon receiving a play when he expected to receive an essay, uh, did not say what the cuss word is this. 
Um, but rather, he said, oh my God, it's a play. So I need you to put your hands together to help, uh, uh, to help me thank Jeffrey and Scott for being so cool and imaginative. Also to include an actor in their pages. Unlike previous works of mine, This Ghost of Slavery is not composed solely of verbatim excerpts from interviews for those of you who, who know that work and hopefully some of you seen it here in Washington. Um, it does contain some material from interviews uh, that I conducted, but it also includes verbatim excerpts of historical documents. I created the story that is the play and most of the language I made up, but it's this kind of interesting blend. Um, Unlike my other works, it is not meant uh, to be performed as a one-person show. The most recent draft calls for 17 actors, a number big enough to create theater producers to break out into hives. <laughs> and rather than bringing 17 actors today, I decided I would just read some excerpts uh, from uh, Ghost as uh, in one, one woman mode, pretty much. This presentation is going to take over just over an hour, depending on whether or not you laugh um, from time to time. I encourage you to laugh. Uh, not all of our history is tragic. Okay. So uh, are you up for it? <laughs> this Ghost of Slavery by Anna DeVere Smith, edited by Scott Stossel. Act one. This play will go back and forth in time and have many locations, some in the 1860s, others in the present. Theater magic will help us move from present to, pre to past and past to present. The past is, after all, present. An 11-year-old slave girl uh, from the 1860s, mixed race, ill-clothed, bare feet, walks across the stage, pulling open a huge curtain. She's our guide in the play. The first scene takes place in the classroom at Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, Maryland, present day. In the back of the room stand Professor Carolina Nelson, PhD, black, mid-30s, dressed in a kind of low-key hip way, sort of academic chic. Um, she is with members of a newly formed nonprofit called Latitude, which she co-directs with Tobias Midwinter, who is black late 40s, wearing sort of runway street fashion. Tobias has bodyguards, both of whom are women. Lindsay Brooks, 20s, black, gorgeous, and Zell Maxwell, 20s, black, charismatic, a jock. Carl Vogel, who is in his 30s, is white. He's a kind of Paul Farmer type of person with a very warm demeanor. He is the staff psychiatrist for Latitude. You'll find out why they need one uh, at some point in the play. Um, nearby are Jack Ross, Professor Jack Ross, white in his early 30s, and the dean, the dean a white male in his late 40s. Anas Ali, a robust black man uh, in his 30s, t-shirt, black jeans, is at the lectern, and he is mid-speech when we meet him, Anas Ali. I didn't mean to kill him. I was 17 years old. I was just trying to scare him. He was a drug addict, and I got him his drugs, and he was messing with my money. But when you kill somebody, that's a heavy thing. When I went to court to be sentenced, the prosecutor asked to give me more time than I was taking a plea bargain for. And I asked the judge, can I talk to the family? So I turned around, and one thing that stuck out to me was I couldn't really identify who was there for him and who was there for me because our families look so much alike. And I told the family that no matter how much time I get, the prosecutor wasn't there to support them. It was just another body that was dead and another person being locked up in prison. I shot a man. It's a heavy thing. And I promised the family that whenever I got out of prison, I would try my best to help young men not make the same decisions as I made. I said that at 17 years old, going to prison. And when I was in prison, 
every Wednesday or Tuesday. It's like a bus that comes into prison every week. You guarantee 10, 20 guys coming into prison. And I just remember looking like it seemed like every Wednesday it was 20 guys. If it's 20 guys, it's 16 black guys, like clockwork. And when I got out, I was 24 years old, and I was just eager to talk to young guys and tell them what's on the other side and how it's just not worth it. Whatever you going through, whatever you going through is so much better than being in prison. If I had to walk miles, it's much better than being in prison. Standing out in the cold, I shot a man when I was 17 years old. It's a heavy thing. Thank you. Ambivalent applause from the students who are undergrads, different races, predominantly white, Asian, and South Asian. Notably, in what ensues now, the students of color do most of the talking. Professor Jack Ross comes up. Well, that, <laughs> that was a real gift. Thank you, Professor Nelson, uh, for giving us your time and on this very hour before your sabbatical begins. Um, grace us with, with a few words, Carolina Nelson. I think after hearing from my collaborators, Anas Ali, Tobias Lindsay, Zell, and Carl, you can imagine why I decided to sit down with them and create Latitude. We will support using a 360 degree approach with our know-how, resources, and friendship. Incarcerated, newly released, and never incarcerated, but vulnerable youth, so that they can work towards substantive, uh, personal, as well as societal change. A woke white male student raises his hand. Is this evidence-based? <laughs> and if so, what evidence do you have that your program works? Carolina. Uh, we don't have evidence yet. It's early, but we have some anecdotes. Tobias? Tobias. So for example, I had a young man come in, popping seven, eight perks, oxys a day, uh, whatever he can get his hands on, just trying to numb himself from the demons he's seen, what he's done, what he's experienced. Uh, he's a shooter, so forth and so on, well known. With our help, he finished his high school diploma, got accepted into a union that would probably not have taken him in if he had not been a part of the program. This is the Brotherhood of the Painters. He owns a townhome now in the suburbs with his fiance, and he's making $50 an hour painting. Black female student. I'm worried about the assumed pathology of black folks. Zell. Uh, <laughs> this ain't about pathology, this is about vulnerability. I think even when you feel ready and safe enough to be vulnerable enough to step outside the box, it's hard to be able to separate from a group that has been in a four block radius, Lindsay. It's just so many things that people are scared to let go of. Carl, we help them introduce themselves and reintroduce themselves to a different part of themselves that people in their immediate circle have never met or would have criticized and or not been supportive of because they haven't been there themselves. Anas Ali, we're in juvenile hall, Zell, hospitals, Carl. Emergency rooms, Tobias, funeral homes, cemeteries, Carl, right nearby the school when somebody's getting kicked out. Zell, basketball carts, Lindsay, in the streets, moving in the streets. I'm the one always moving in the streets. Anas Ali, and of course, the crazy down home, chicken and seafood on Edmondson Avenue. Black male student, Carolina, um, don't you feel that you're taking advantage of them, appropriating their stories? Tobias, Carolina, wow, y'all are a trip. Black female student, when you put your work in writing, who will be the lead author? We just don't think that she should be exploiting you. Okay, 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 Tobias, okay, okay, hold, hold up, hold, hold up, hold up. She, <laughs> don't y'all, don't y'all refer to her as professor? Woke white male student, we don't believe in assumed hierarchies. <laughs> There's just been so much harm done, so much pain has been caused by centuries of genuflecting, kneeling, bowing to those who supposedly know. 
We need new rules of engagement. And Tobias, cool, 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 cool. OK. Uh, we got a roll. <laughs> so let me just say this. Y'all tickle me. Uh, when I was growing up around Pennsylvania Avenue, we were poor, then we were indigent, then disenfranchised, and now <laughs> I've been checking out the classes around here with Dr. Nelson. I have never heard half the words y'all use when you're talking about us and about how we live. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, you know, Johns Hopkins has been a part of our lives. Zell. My grandmama used to say in Baltimore, the black women work at Hopkins and the black men go to jail. Tobias, and absolutely. Johns Hopkins University, Hopkins Hospital folks have made a difference on many blocks in Baltimore, but Hopkins never came on my block. And um, uh, as fate, and maybe my luck would have it, while Dr. Carolina Nelson was in the hood doing research, she found me. I was left for dead and just about dead physically, spitting on my grave dead societally, and flatlining dead spiritually. She found me, Anasali. They found each other, Tobias. And we got this massively insane idea. And before you know it, we're putting down on paper this outrageous proposition that together we might be able to do something and suggest the things that would save lives. Another student. We just don't think that she should take advantage of you, Tobias. Whoa, 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 wow, there's that she again. And they say that we are disrespectful in the hood to our public school teachers. OK, look, I'm from the streets. If I don't know the difference between a friend and a parasite, well, hey. And if being friends with one of your professors and her being friends with me is getting taken advantage of and or being appropriated, don't worry about me, worry about her. <laughs> about me taking advantage of her. Because that's exactly what I plan on doing while we build out latitude, take advantage of her knowledge, her connections. I mean, yeah, I'm going to take advantage of all that. Why do you trust her? The question is, why does Dr. Nelson trust us? Anas Ali. It's mutual. <laughs> Y'all cool with mutual? Carl, mutuality? <laughs> Some of the students kind of glance at each other, others surreptitiously. Jack ste steps back up to the lectern. Jack. Dr. Nelson, I can't think thank you enough for introducing us to your new co co cohort. So um, that's it. OK, everybody, we're flipping the syllabus. Next week, G. Stanley Hall on Storm and Stress, not Janae's The Criminal Child. The students split. Tobias and Asa Lee, Carl, flanked by Zell, and Lindsay start to head out. Jack, Professor Ross, goes up to Carolina. <sighs> it's just, I wish they were kinder. I wish they were less cynical. Wish they could spare just a little bit benefit of the doubt. Oh my God, I am so gonna miss you. They embrace. Okay, so that is the end of scene one. And now, now please help me welcome to the stage Jeffrey Goldberg, editor of The Atlantic Magazine, who is going to perform the Dean in the next brief scene. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> the dean steps in to talk with Carolina. I'm worried about you. The women with us are armed. Tobias is bodyguard. I'm safe. I'm serious. So am I. The provost granted you this leave, but by the time you get here, he will have stepped out of his provisorial role, gone back to teaching medieval pottery. You'll meet with a promotions committee that has long stopped genuflecting to the VP of diversity. In fact, the greater likelihood is that there will not be a VP of diversity. As for that big heart of yours, you need to remember that you are an academic, not Mother Teresa. Sorry, that, that comment was, I guess, disrespectful. To Mother Teresa, yes. <laughs> you got to get that second book done, period, full stop. I went to a double funeral last week for a 12-year-old and a 13-year-old, both gunned down by a 14-year-old. Who's the book for? Who's going to read it? I know you're masterful at fundraising, and it's blasphemous to say this, but why do we need another building? How about pouring those 10 digits into the community? Your arguments usually have more teeth than that. 
Zell slides up. Honestly, I, mean, I just don't get it, Jeff. I, I just don't. I mean, wow, I'm almost out the door, and we have discussed this, what, 10 times, 11, 12 times? Zell, mind if I cut in here? Uh, we got to jump. The dean takes off quickly. <laughs> Zell, never lose your cool around a white dude. That's like fighting with a cop. You will lose, girl. They still got the power. He kind of like a, a control freak, kind of like a dominating kind of cat. Carolina, not a cat at all, a dog. <laughs> Give it up again for Jeffrey Goldberg. Uh, so the next scene takes place in a youth development center, a.k.a. a juvie somewhere in Maryland. The room looks and smells brand new on the brightly painted walls or inspirational quotations in particular from Maya Angelou. Our latitude folks sit in an intense circle with Jackson, black, 17, supremely handsome, looks like a young Harry Belafonte. He's not wearing prison style clothes, but khakis and a polo shirt, which are the basic uniform in this facility. He listens to bias. Because in your case, you could walk out the door with us today, Anas Ali. Fast as you got arrested and your life changed, that's today. Your life will change in less than 40 minutes with us out that door. Jackson, I just feel like, um, can, can I tell y'all how I, how I feel on a, committed, on a committed thing? Carolina, absolutely. Jackson. Once you get committed, once you get locked up, they provide you with a job, provide you with all the services, but it's like, once your commitment expires, it's like they done with you. Like group ser youth services, they not there for you no more. They don't provide you with no job or no tutor, no mentor and stuff, because you're not, you're not under the government. You're not a ward of the state no more. Yeah, so I'm worried about that. I mean, sometimes it makes me feel like, I wish I could stay committed. I wish I could stay locked up until I was 21, which is bad because, I mean, if you get locked up, then you could be sent out anywhere they want to send you. They could send you out to Utah, Minnesota, Nebraska. But at the same time, I really feel like to help me get through this, through life, I need them services that they provide for me because it actually helps me. You get released from jail, they're not giving you none of these type of services, you know? And I said, you right, you right, they dump you right outside the door and make it on your own. But we got you, man, we got you, little brother. All those services you have in here, you're gonna have all that. Out there in the free world, we will provide wraparound services, life coaches, therapists, help with your GED, job placement, Lindsay. Jackson, you look like you bodybuild. We got all that, brand new gym, nutrition classes. Zell, I'm in charge of strength training. You got any kids? Jackson, yeah, a son. Carl, have you ever spent a full day with your son? Jackson, no. We have parenting classes. And Carolina, this is, this is not a one-time thing. We will commit to you for five years, Anas Ali, if you will commit to us, and no paperwork. Once you get on the other side of that door, that same door you walked in when you got incarcerated, someone will hand you one piece of paper to sign, sell one signature, Lindsay. Jackson, you look skeptical. What's up? Anasali, what you going, what's going on, Jackson, Carl? There's no judgment here. Jackson, it's like, now you're back on the street, you're trying to make money, you're doing all the things to get you right back in a place like this. Selling drugs, stealing, stealing cars, robbing people, them things that could lead you back in the same predicament, even worse. And you're right back 
from ground, ground, ground A, where you started. You know, you come in a community looking up to a person who you really don't want to look up to, asking them, oh, can, I, can you get me some drugs so, you could, so I could get some money that you could, you know, that I could sell it and get some money and stuff like that. Not knowing it could be today or tomorrow where you could actually be right back locked up. I mean, in the same situation, it's really not worth it. You see what I'm saying? I'd rather have a job in here and get money that way that keep looking over my back worrying about when the police gonna ride up and try to grab me or something like that Lindsay you just need somebody to move with you in the streets I'm known for how I move in the streets my daddy was a chief my daddy was Mississippi foreman that's how I learned to move moving 10 steps behind my daddy I saw I saw everything about the streets, and I said, ain't a street here from here to Hong Kong where Lindsay can't move and stay safe and stay Lindsay, stay legal. Lindsay will hang with you. Lindsay will hang with you. Jackson, well, that, that, that'd be amazing. <laughs> a small boy blasts in, enraged. Another boy blasts into the room and repeatedly throws the small boy up against the wall. The smaller boy breaks loose, gets a chair, and starts hammering the other boy. A male guard in street clothes struts in without any visible urgency. He wordlessly guides our latitude folks into another room with a glass door and a window. Jackson, still in direct proximity to the violence, watches unfazed as blood explodes from these boys as they fight. A very large black female guard enters. She and the male guard stand by as the fight escalates. In a moment when both boys are down on the ground, the female guard sits on top of them. The male guard handcuffs them and leads them out. The door of the room holding our latitude folks automatically, soundlessly slides open. They return to Jackson and resume as though nothing out of the ordinary has happened, Tobias. So, where were we? First long pause in the scene happens here. Jackson, yeah. Y'all basically the same type of people like the people on the street, except sober. Except you, he nods at Carolina. You a teacher? Carolina, I am. Jackson nods to Tobias. <laughs> I just figured out who you are, man. People say you went underground <laughs> in Africa, something like that. Tobias, midwinter, you a legend, man. You used to run the world from Landvale Street clear to D.C. and up to Wilmington, the racetracks and stuff like that. You gave all that up, man. What kind of car are you driving now? Tobias, but I wasn't free. Now I'm free. And you can be free. Freedom. We're talking about freedom, Jackson. Jackson. Oh, man. You know, I feel like laughing. And yet, still, I feel like crying. Y'all too good to be true. Anything too good to be true ain't true. And Jackson struts away, princely gate. The door slides open and slides shut. A beat of defeated silence. Zell. Well, all righty then, it is Friday afternoon and we ending up this particular week without a single recruit, Carl. So many of the quotes on this wall are from Maya Angelou, Anas Ali. Wonder if she would think this is an honor. <laughs> Zell, if I was Maya Angelou, I'd rather have my quotes up on the walls of a sparkling new junior college than have my quotes up on the wall of a sparkling new junior prison. 
Tobias. What's the point? What's the point if the kids don't even believe they can be free? How did we get here? How did we get here? And that's the end of the scene in the juvenile facility. And those, those, those words, how do we get here, are the launch uh, that our Latitude folks take. And they begin an inquiry about how did we get here, meaning how did we get here in juvenile justice and in the child welfare system. And this, is, well, this, this inquiry, this, this journey they go on in the past and present, it lasts the rest of the play. Carolina, who is a lapsed historian, first takes them to the Maryland State Archives where they delve into what happened to children at the very moment when Maryland, the state of Maryland, eh, emancipated the slaves. They learn that Maryland slaves were not emancipated with the Emancipation Proclamation in, in 1863. Uh, that was meant for the states that had seceded. Maryland was in the South, but it did not secede. It was also part slave and part part free. Strategically, Lincoln could not afford to have Maryland secede due to its proximity to Washington. Some say Lincoln kind of turned the other way with regard to slaves in Maryland, to keep Maryland in the Union. Still, the state tossed and turned about slavery. And in 1864, a constitutional convention was held to decide what to do. At that conven convention, a very important word was evoked, and that word led to a long debate. The word was apprentice. There had always been apprenticeships, apprenticeship laws pertaining to, pertaining to both black and white children. If there were no parents or if the parents were unable to take care of them, they would end up in orphan's court and be assigned as apprentices usually to uh, white people. However, this proposition was more disturbing. It provided for newly freed black children to be taken back to the plantations. Newly freed parents, who were for the most part illiterate, had to go to court and prove that they could take care of their children. And here is a scene uh, that I've composed, editing the verbatim segments, ed uh, editing verbatim segments from the transcript of that conversation. When I print it out, I'm not exaggerating. When I print, they liked to talk a lot back then. Maybe they still do now. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, when I printed out um, the, the, the transcript of the convention, it was like about this high in my, my office. OK, so I'm going to go back and forth with the different, different delegates' chambers. We are about to turn loose upon the community every minor Negro in the state, uneducated, unprepared for the condition of freedom, with no employment, no business, no vocation. Thousands upon thousands are to be turned loose, Reverend Todd ordered that the Committee on the Judicial Department of Competent Jurisdiction be instructed to inquire into the expediency of incorporating into this Constitution a provision making it the duty of the legislature to provide by law for the apprenticeship of emancipated Negroes who are minors so as to better provide for their welfare and their preparation for freedom. Archibald Sterling leaps to his feet. I am opposed to that article. The necessary effect of it will be to perpetuate slavery in Maryland for 10 years longer. This section provides absolutely for the binding out of an entire class of persons without any reference to the condition of the emancipated parents of these children, without any regard to the age of the children, whether they are 8 or 18 years of age, whether they are competent to earn a livelihood or not. This section is not so much to provide for the custody of these children as it is to compensate the masters, Henry Stockbridge. I move to amend by adding to the section the words. And said court shall bind all masters to cause said apprentices to be taught to read and write. William T. Purnell. The articles of apprenticeship or the indentures 
are not required to express that the Negro shall be educated. Does anyone profess upon this floor that the Negro will ever occupy the status of the white man, the god of nature, when he created, stamped upon their forehead, the mark as broad and lasting as a mark upon Cain. The idea that the Negro can ever elevate himself to the condition of the white man is preposterous, but unfortunately, the white man can debase himself to the condition of the Negro. Joseph B. Pugh. I am astonished this morning. The impression might prevail that we were in favor of elevating the Negro race. We're in favor of something like Negro equality, a rehash of that political, wishy-washy, meaningless talk. It is neither, it is better, it is better to have educated labor than uneducated labor. It is per perfectly proper to educate a horse, Chambers, ha, ha, to read and write, pew. You can educate a horse to do other things. You can educate a horse in other ways than to read and write. If you could teach a horse to read and write, it would be a good thing, but you cannot do that. But you can teach the Negro to read and write, Chambers. Not all of them, pew. Well, some of them then. Some of them. You cannot teach some white men to read and write. It is an obsolete idea that it is not better to educate all classes of the community. There is no human being so low that he cannot be improved to some extent by education. I am astonished that Mr. Purnell should see in that amendment some evidence that we acknowledge that the Negro is our equal. I have never had any such fear. Take two men, the one six feet high, the other five feet high. That is their stature so designed by the Almighty. Put them on the same platform, there is no way in which their two heads can be upon the same level, unless he who is taller, the taller man, should stoop. Now, other gentlemen may do as they please, but we do not intend to stoop. But I claim from motives of political economy as well as from motives of morality and, and of religion that the Negro shall be educated, shall be developed to the highest degree that he is capable. I claim it. I claim it because it is the proper course to be pursued in order to fully develop the resources of the nation. It is the proper course to be pursued in order to make the labor of the nation the most available. For that reason, I am in favor of educating everybody of every color. And I will stand upon that, flat, that platform every where. And you might as well say that it's not proper to educate a certain class of white people because thereby you elevate them to the level of the aristocrats. Huh. So by education, you develop most fully all the resources of the people. Now, I have objections to the apprenticing of Negroes especially to their masters. We have especially provided in our Bill of Rights that no man shall have any claim upon another by reason of the institution of slavery, richly. This is no, it's just not necessary. This is no proposition to enslave a free man. And it requires a most extraordinary stretch of imagination for any mind to reach any such conclusion or to engraft any such interpretation upon the proposition. What is the proposition? That the jurisdiction of the orphans court touching free Negroes and mulattoes as now exercised by law shall be so extended as to authorize them to give the preference in apprenticing such Negroes and mulattoes to their former masters. That is all it means. It means nothing more and nothing less. The only question before our house is this. Will you give a preference to the master over a stranger in a apprenticing a free Negro or mulatto. I vote for this proposition, not for any purpose of enslaving the apprentice, not for the purpose of caring for the interests of the master, but because you cannot get rid of the fact that you throw upon the community a large number of these people who are helpless. From youth and from age, they are about to be thrown upon their own resources, helpless, Cushing. I submit that it is simply absurd that there should be a law of Maryland that forces a man back into the condition of an apprentice to serve a master and receive no wages. A hundred thousand free blacks in Maryland 
support themselves. The experience of the city of Baltimore tells you that there are no more, no, there is no more prosperous class of labor in the state of Maryland today than free black labor. They are abundantly able to support themselves by their own exertions. There are no more of them in the almhouses than of white people, Sterling. As a matter of fact, you cannot get labor, black or white, though you cry for it. A gentleman told me the other day that he paid $2 and a half a day to get an old colored man for whitewashing a wall and could not get him for less. Gentlemen, talk about protecting these helpless Negroes. Will anybody say <laughs> that a Negro boy, 16 years of age, or even 12 years of age, is not capable of making his own living right now. The Negro has no apprehension. Let them take care of themselves. I see no policy to be pursued in regard to those who are too old to take care of themselves. I see no proposition to have apprenticed to the master. Those are too young to take care of themselves. But I see a proposition that those who are able to take care of themselves and to assist in taking care of those others shall be re-enslaved for the purpose of providing compensation to those from whom they have been taken. And what's going to become of the parents? If the master does not choose to employ the parents and you take away the children, who is going to support the parents? You not only force the minor who is emancipated to remain in custody with the same man who held him before as a slave, but you force the parents to stay there also. I confess that I am surprised <laughs> to hear men who have stood upon this floor and argued eloquent language about the sinfulness of the institution of slavery, who have advocated before this convention that every slave in this state was held by a thief's title, to now get up here and advocate the holding out of this proposition as a conciliatory measure to the disloyal element in this state, Ridgely. This ghost of slavery that has been invoked, I will not say invoked for the purpose of killing the proposition, has the effect of intimidating. There must be apprentices. Stockbridge. It is proposed to take without a single exception. Every female child who shall be emancipated by the, oper of the operation of this Constitution, who shall be under the age of 18 from her parents, whatever may be their condition, however able and willing they may be to support her and bind her in unwilling servitude until she shall have attained the age of 18 and to take every male child in the same way until he shall have reached the age of 21 years. Now, where is the right, the justice, I, the decency? Wholly depriving the parent of all the rights over the child, and wholly depriving the child growing up to freedom of all right to receive at least the rudiments of an education, I shall not vote for such an atrocious measure as this. End of scene.
so after our, uh, our folks get a load of that, they're in Tobias's loft, it's present day, and Zell says, it's built in, it's built in. They do not want us anywhere but the plantations, Tobias. So wait, 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 cool, cool, cool. So you're saying that even, they, 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 before they even got to determine if they were gonna set the slaves free, they were in there arguing about taking children back to the plantations. They do not want us in the mix. Not then, not now. It's built in, it's built in. Carolina, <clears throat> short answer, no. The apprenticeship proposition was initially approved, but it was revisited several weeks later and some of the representatives reconsidered it and decided to vote against it. Many citing concerns that it would be abused, so it failed. Zell, whoo, hallelujah, whistles. Now we're gonna go back into the past. Whistles, a brass band, cheers. Carolina speaks as this parade starts around her. On October the 12th and 13th, 1864, the votes were cast, and October the 29th in Maryland, Maryland went for freeing the slaves. Yay, festoons, parades, church choirs, dancing in the streets, preachers of both races preaching on the corners, church bells, fireworks, a five-gun salute. Our 11-year-old slave girl runs across the stage, unfurling a banner that says, freedom! A mass of black people follow behind her in a parade. The Latitude team are now surrounded on stage by this party from the past. They are in it. The past is overtaking the present, and the Latitude team has no choice but to participate. Mardi Gras on steroids. White people are dancing. Black people are dancing. Jubilation. One of the white revelers comes on over and tries to dance with Tobias. Hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> did white people really celebrate like this with us, Carl? Well, let's pretend they did. So the party <laughs> resumes, reaches a height, and then the adults leave. There's a chorus of child revelers, black children. Imagine an opera chorus of children. Black children of different ages, from toddlers to 20-year-olds, they stay behind. And just like children always do, they play with the scraps, the leftovers of the party. Carolina, Maryland was very proud to have freed its slaves before the passage of an amendment in the United States Constitution requiring it. But, Tobias, but, Carolina, one day after emancipation, one day, one day, November the, November the 2nd, 1864, one day, the music now resumes in a kind of like weird, dissonant, kind of joyous until a video projection splashes onto the backstage wall of the stage with the text, Black Child Seizure Day, November the 2nd, 1864. Slave catchers swarm the stage and grab black children. Lights up on an ox cart full of black children. Our 11-year-old slave girl runs to try to get away. She's grabbed and thrown onto the ox court. White men with, mus with muscular thugs are pushing children into these ox carts. Carl, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait. White man with a list. Next, Elizabeth Turner. He grabs our 11-year-old slave girl. Wait, this is, this is, wait, this is unbelievable. Carolina, is it, Carl? Is it? Imagine you have a way to keep the sturdiest part of your workforce. And they aren't like 11, 12, 13-year-old kids now who, you know, have to be watched, have to go to sports, and kids in the hood who hang out. These are robust teens and preteens who can haul water, dig dishes, take care of babies. Butcher pigs, pick tobacco. Well, wait a minute. You you said that that bullshit amendment or law, you you said it didn't you you said it didn't pass. I said, but. And here's a girl, eight years old, eleven years old. She can babysit, clean, and so imagine, imagine what you should, she will be to you when she's twelve, thirteen. Whenever she gets her period, she can bear children. You can increase your servant population. 
In this case, the young girl in question is your property, Elizabeth Turner. And Carl, let's just say you're her master, one Philemon Hamilton of Talbot County. You tell me, Carl, what would you do? Carl freezes. Carolina. Carl, what would you do? Anasali, Carl. Michelle, Carl, Lindsay, Carl, baby, Tobias, Carl. Carl cautiously goes towards Elizabeth Turner, who is also our little girl, grabs her by the hand. Where are you taking me? Hamilton, played by Carl. Home, Elizabeth. But sir, your place ain't my home no more. My mama looking for a place to be. Mama and them didn't know where to go. Didn't know where to go. That's the only reason we still here. Mama and them didn't know where to go. But we're not coming back to you, sir. We free. Carl grabs her. She starts to scream. He deals with her as though it's not 1864, but as though she were a kid having a meltdown in a mall. Everything's going to be okay. Okay, Anasali, call, man, it's 1864. This girl is your property. Ain't no like everything's going to be okay. Ain't nothing okay. Dig, take her like you own her, man. You own her. Carl grabs Elizabeth, drags her off stage, and she's screaming. The ox cart sweeps around the stage with very threatening lightning with children, and off they go, Tobias. Clarity, clarity, I need clarity. You told us that the vote went against apprenticeships. So what the F is going on here, Carolina? They used a, a black code law, Anas Ali. To they are the law, man. They are the law. Always been. Always will be. Carolina, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, they are. The law, they were able to see a black code, take a, use a black code from 1860, which allowed for the apprenticing of children of freed blacks. Take them back to the plantation. So, based on that, they forced black children in Maryland, the day after slavery had been torn down, the day after emancipation, they gathered up the black children, put them in apprenticeships, girls until they were 18, boys until they were 21. Zell, this is a fact? Carolina, yeah. Lindsay, a real fact? Carolina, yeah. I'll show you documents for real. End of Act One. And so as the rest of the play ensues, our modern day characters move into the past, taking on the roles of individuals who were part of shutting down the apprenticeship system. And key was the case of the little girl, and it pleases me that it was a little girl, Elizabeth Turner, who was, is our muse throughout the entire uh, play. She, she goes in the present in sort of disturbing ways as well. Our mixed race girl, um, is the, is, it's her case around which the apprenticeship program came down. I went, if you go to St. Michael, actually, that, Talbot County is where a lot of stuff happened, and I, I was pleased to find right there the actual day, Justices Leonard and Hopkins to Philemon T. Hamilton, Negro girl, Betsy Turner, daughter of Betsy Turner, born October 8, 1856 to serve until she is 18. The name's funny, names are never consistent. Um, so, this happened, and if you are vacationing in St. Michael, the name Hamilton is all over that town. That was just one county. There were thousands of children 
in Maryland who were taken, black, taken back onto the plantations. The Freedmen's Bureau in Baltimore took on Elizabeth Turner's case. It made it to the Supreme Court. And with the help of Chief Justice Salmon Chase, her case took it down. That court case in Ray Turner is available and it really is key in this play. Chasing that which is not me. Chasing that which is me. Here's a bit of family lore that I'm going to end with because some of my family are here today. My generation and then my nephew is here with his wife and my two sisters. I don't know if they know the story, so this might be a surprise, at least for my nephew. Among the first people I ever interviewed when I was creating the way that I work, and I've now interviewed thousands of people, was my late Aunt Esther, Mrs. Esther Blake. With my Panasonic portable cassette tape recorder, I was experimenting with Aunt Esther. I sat at her kitchen table on McCullough Street and interviewed her, rehearsal in a way. And so this is verbatim from that interview of Aunt Esther. Long as I can remember, people always told me I was cute. But I never felt that I was cute. I never thought that I was an ugly child, nor did I think that I was a pretty child. I just always thought that I was a child. All my life, people told me that I was cute. And I know when I was little, a white lady stole me. You haven't heard that tale? Oh, well, when we were on Biddle Street, you had the Richmond Market up there, and you had people coming up from Charles Street and Cathedral Street and whatnot. And the Richmond Market was a very good market. You got gourmet foods up there and all like that. And I know Daddy, your grandfather, used to bring Miss Langrell in from Roland Park to shop at the Richmond Market and all. All of that going along with going to the Lexington Market. And you had the maids and the butlers and whatnot from the big houses over on Charles Street coming over to the Richmond Market getting things. And from what I understand, I was out on the front. And mother used to always keep me looking real nice. So I was out on the front. And Aunt Argyle was supposed to be watching me. And Aunt Argyle wasn't too bright. And they looked, and I wasn't on the front. I was like between two and three, something like that. And when I was little, I had these big blue eyes and blonde hair, curly blonde hair. You can see by my baby picture how I was. Well, they were all up and down looking for Esther. I was like the pet of the block. I was very friendly, very outgoing. Man, one man used to tell this story about how I came up to him and said, aren't my shoes delicious? <laughs> and like the Krauses who lived up the street, they went up to the Krauses. I went up there. Miss Robinson hadn't seen me. Miss Patterson, who loved me like her own child, she didn't know where I was. The barber, nobody knew where I was. Well, I was just one of those little friendly children. Well, the word got out that Esther is missing. Well, the story gets vague, but from what I understand, is somebody who worked on Cathedral Street realized that they had been looking for me and said, well, a white lady was taking Esther down to a house on Cathedral Street. Well, they went down there, and here I was with this white woman. It seemed like she asked me that I want some candy or some ice cream or something. Maybe she was just one of those women who always wanted a child. And I just went right on with her. Let's well, see. What always puzzled me. See, I was light-skinned then. Like I met somebody not long ago who said, you look different. said, yeah. I got told a fellow when I went over to work in Washington, he said, what happened to your hair? It used to be lighter. You done it? 
I'm wondering now. I'm wondering now. Had they not found me, and she kept me, and I started blossoming. <laughs> blossoming out with all these Negroid features, what would have happened? She wouldn't have known, and I would have been one of those people who grew up without knowing their heritage. It has happened. So I have performed that story for years, and it's kind of funny. Blossoming, blossoming. But it wasn't until, I guess, two years ago when I started to learn about the apprenticeships. Aunt Esther was born around 1914. That's just 50, that's, it's not that long, really, when you think of how long it takes to change things, to change attitudes. And so, you know, now when I think about that line, well, the word got out that Esther was missing. What if I said it like this? Well, the word got out that Esther was missing. Then we think about what happened. And that white lady may not have been a white lady who always wanted a child. She could have been a white lady who wanted a servant. Chasing that which is not me, chasing that which is me. Thank you so very much. Thank you.